All right, so here's what you're going to be doing to give kind of an overview, and we'll talk about this in more detail. But you're going to do the Kaggle dog breed identification data set. So this is the one I mentioned the other day where there are 120 different breeds of dogs. And the end result of this is that you're going to actually not just train a model, but then go ahead and take the test data from Kaggle, identify all this, these unlabeled dog images, and then submit that. Okay? And you're going to create a, Python, a Jupyter notebook showing this along with a team member. So it'll, you, can work, you will be working in pairs. And you're going to submit that via Git, okay, Git Classroom. So you're going to be um, pushing your, or your um, Python notebook, your Jupyter notebook. Does that kind of overview make sense? Any questions on that? So what sort of accounts are you going to need for this? You need a Kaggle account. What else? You need a Git account. How many, be, how many of you have Git accounts already? OK, like anyone not have a Git account? OK, that's part simple. Anything else you'll need? You'll need a Clouderizer account. We'll talk about that in more detail. And hopefully, things will work beautifully today, unlike the last two days we used it. Um, and you'll need a machine with a CPU. Sorry. A GPU. The CPU-less machines are just so boring. So we'll go ahead and do a machine with a GPU. How many of you have machines with GPUs? OK. Are you gamers? Or are you Bitcoin miners? Or what? Why do you have a GPU? I used to play games a lot, but then I OK. He's a reformed gamer. <laughs> All right. So those of you who have GPUs of any reasonable size, you'll find the easiest thing as long as you're uh, well, that's as long. If you're running Ubuntu, then that'll be nice and easy. If you're not, it will be a little bit harder um, to do. Otherwise, though, you're going to use one of three different cloud services. Cloud service number one. AWS. AWS is, uh, we'll look at how we use that in Cloudarizer. It's integrated well. You just click start, it starts up your instance and runs it all. And if you click stop from Cloudarizer, it stops it. Why is that really important? That if you click stop from Cloudarizer, it stops your instance in AWS. So it stops charging you. That's right. Because if you're using AWS, it is on your dime. Right? Uh, if, and the second opportunity is for what you could, how you can get a GPU machine in the cloud. Google, okay, Collaboratory from Google. This is free. Uh, it's not without its challenges, but it, I have had very good success with it everywhere except in this classroom. Uh, it's perhaps the demo effect. But there's no charge on that. Limitations are you can be preempted, and you can't run more than 12 hours on the same instance. Right? If you want to go ahead and create a new Collaboratory instance, you can do that. You'll have to kind of redo some of the setup, though. And then the third option is Google Compute Engine. Did you all get uh, an email from me with an invitation for $50 credit? OK. So yes, thank you to those folks at Google for that. Um, so $50 will get you how many hours of GPU machine would you guess? 20. OK, 20 is not within an order of magnitude. OK, let's say 100. So 100 would mean we're looking at 50 cents an hour. And that's about right. Um, it's, we're within that ballpark. So if he's a, maybe you were within order of magnitude. OK, but uh, <laughs> so you weren't within a binary order of magnitude. So the price is going to depend on what options you choose. And the biggest price differential is going to be whether you choose to have a preemptible instance or not. So preemptible is cheaper, but it means you could get kicked off at any time. So for me, it's, it's, it's worth that. Okay? So 100 hours uh, may very well be enough that you'll need um, for this year. So if you wanted to use Google Compute Engine, then you could and not use Collaboratory. Okay. ADWS is going to be slightly more expensive just because I don't think they have preemptible instances. But it's still less than a buck a, a buck an hour. 
Okay? But just be very mindful of not leaving instances running. Okay? I have certainly had unhappy AWS and Google Cloud um, bills. Not that unhappy. It's like you know, 30, 40 bucks for a month, but it's like I thought I wasn't using it. And so I had to go kind of track down and figure out what's going on there. OK, so if you want AWS, you're going to also need to set up an AWS account. Questions on that? Does that make sense? So the good news is we have no textbooks you have to purchase for the class. The bad news is if you want to use AWS or you're using Google Compute Engine more than 50 bucks, then you have to, you have to pay for that. If that is a big problem for someone, come, come see me privately. Questions so far? All right, let's go ahead and get started. So let us start with Clouderizer. So we have a Clouderizer cheat sheet. I have a bunch of cheat sheets here, and you'll say, wow, that's really weird. You have, like, paper. And the reason for that is, first, I think you might um, treat it with more seriousness. And second, it's just handy sometimes to not have to be multitasking your screen. So I have a number of cheat sheets I'm passing out today. This particular cheat sheet, because it's hot off the press, is not the standard cheat sheet paper material in that it's not cardstock. It's just regular old paper. So um, I will, as we prove this out, because unfortunately these instructions, I'm the only one that's ever gone through them. As, as, as people go through in real life, there'll probably be some corrections to be made here. So. Let me know about those corrections on Piazza. I'll make those corrections, and then I'll print out final versions of these uh, on cardstock next week and give them to you. So it just summarizes on this cheat sheet the steps you have to go through and the things to keep in mind and what options you want to choose and what options you don't want to choose. So let me head over to Clouderizer, and let's just get started. I have some projects. In fact, I have one running project. Um, and in fact, it's a GCE Google Compute Engine project, so that is, uh, is running, but I'm going to go ahead and stop it. And that's great. So I'm not being charged now? No. So let's see, get page two of your cheat sheet at the bottom right, stopping projects. In Clouderizer, click stop. Great. Within Google Compute Engine, go to the Google console.cloud.google.com, which is here. Let me try and make this bigger so we can see it. And it says we have to go to Compute Engine, Compute, Compute Engine VM Instances, which is here. And from the menu at the right of CS152, OK. My instance name with previous instructions would have been this instance would have been called CS152. You have to click stop. And the warning is if you don't stop or until you stop, you're being charged. So keep that in mind. Go collaboratory, you're never going to get charged, right? No matter what happens. So that part's good. Your own machine, unless you have a very odd accounting system, you're also not being charged. It may eat into your. Um, Bitcoin earnings, perhaps. Uh, all right, so let's get back over to Clouderizer. I have nothing running. I have a couple of projects. You're likely not going to have multiple projects. You don't actually need to have separate projects for AWS and, and Google Compute Engine and Collaboratory. I've done that just to train, keep clear what's going on. So what you'll do is you go to Community Projects. So this is, so let's go back here. Where are we? We are. Project creation. Uh, let's actually look at the preferences first. So in settings, cloud settings, you enable Google Drive. So you enable Clouderizer to access your Google Drive. Make changes. And the reason for that is so it can create a Clouderizer folder. And within there, put all of your code and your output and so on. So that as you move from machine to machine, like one collaboratory instance to another, or from collaboratory to uh, AWS, that this Google Drive files will migrate along with you. Okay? So you have some uh, shared environment. Kaggle credentials. Uh, there are some instructions on here to go to Kaggle. 
get a API token and upload it to here. Okay, so that will allow Clouderizer to make Kaggle calls on your behalf. One potential thing you need to realize is in order to download data sets for competitions, you need to agree to the rules of the competition. And so that's something you have to do from the user interface of Kaggle. So just kind of keep that in mind. Um, and AWS, if you're using AWS, you'll put in your key ID and your secret access key, and there's a link here on how to, how to do that. So that's how it can then start AWS instances on your behalf. Uh, AWS network setup, uh, I would suggest we probably want to do west and not east. Yeah, so Laurel. And I just choose West North California because I realize that's even closer. So let's, someone's going to make a change there and put it in uh, Northern California. And I will update the master later. All right. So I'm set here. Now I'm going to go to project creation, which is from community projects. I'm cloning our HMC CS152. You get to set a project name. Uh, my recommendation here is prep CS152. Uh, you don't ever get to change this later, so I, I'm going to put in a feature request for you to be able to edit it. But you can't edit it, so make something good. I'm going to call this CS152 uh, live, just to mean in class. And then what it's done is copied everything from the cloned project. So here's where you get to choose whether you want a, a AWS instance or right now not, anything else, okay? You can see they'll have um, Google Cloud at some point later. So you can keep it at local machine. If you want to run a project on AWS, you can just go edit and go change the machine type to be AWS. So again, you don't need to have separate projects. There's a bunch of stuff that could get installed, okay? One of the things that could get installed is a Kaggle data set. By default, dogs and cats is installed already. It's not the official dogs and cats data set. Why not? I mentioned it briefly on Monday. The reason is they don't have the same directory structure. So instead of having a dogs and a cats directory and then a bunch of dog pictures in the dogs and cat pictures in the cats and also they, they haven't separated out training and validation. Okay? So it's organized slightly differently. It's packaged differently, and that gets uh, installed by default in this project, the dogs and cats. So if you want a different Kaggle tag set, data set, you put in your Kaggle data set here. Now the question, though, is how do you know what a good Kaggle data set is? Dog breed? I don't know. I doubt that's right. In fact, it's not right. So what you have to do is go over to Kaggle. And I think as it says right here, yes, enter any additional desired Kaggle data sets, get the name from Kaggle Competition Data Tab API field. So if I look here for the dog breed, identification competition, and look at the data tab, and scroll down, see 120 dog breeds. Here, see this API? This shows you the actual name. So there is a Kaggle uh, command line interface that you can use, and this is showing how you use the Kaggle command line interface. But the key here is what's the name of the data set? Dog breed identification. So let's, I could do that. Dog breed identification. Uh, there's no other stuff that I need to get installed. This is all uh, fine. Next here, there's nothing I particularly need to install. Over on the top right, this is how the uh, dogs and cats is being loaded. So you can, if there's any public file or zip file that's there, uh, you can download that. And we're loading code from our CS152 Git repository. That's a good thing. Uh, I guess, actually, once you go to 
GitHub for Classroom and set up a team. It's going to make a repository for the two of you. And you could put this repository in instead. Okay? Or once you've gone ahead and um, initialized your machine and everything else, just go into the terminal window and go to, let's say, your code directory and do a git clone of, the, uh, of your particular project. I think either one should work. All right, so my project name is CS152 Live. I click Finish, and I've now created a project. Okay, And I'm going to just close it here. And if I want to start it running, since it's not an AWS, it doesn't know how to start up the machine right, and communicate with it. So therefore, it gives you a command line to run, right, which is basically going to pull a shell script from Cloud Ariser and run it. So let's go ahead and do that. Trying to think of where we want to do that. Let's do that in our GCE instance. Okay, this is not it, this is not it, this is not it. Okay, so I'm in Google Compute Engine. I have this instance. Let me start it running. I'm going to show you how to create an instance in a little bit. I'm going to be build. You are build also, not just for the um, machine, but also for disk space for the machine. So it's not very much, but be aware of that. And I'll show it to you, and I'll show you the price as we are creating uh, our instance a little bit later. So I'm doing this a little backwards, and then I'm using an instance we've already created. And the reason is because I want to get it to go chugging along and doing its thing, because it'll take a few minutes. So once it is finished starting, then this SSH uh, button will become, there we go. And you have a couple possibilities here. You can open it in a browser window and just be running SSH in a browser window. If you use another SSH client, then that's not what I suggested. That's not what I thought. Let's see. There is a way where it will give you the SSH command. But in any case, let's just run it in a window. And in a matter of seconds, I have my bash here. And it does say I can dramatically improve, and I haven't looked to see what that is. So I just did a paste. And now it go, it got the shell, it's doing a bunch of stuff. Okay. I believe that this will be quicker second and subsequent times, so since I already ran it, it should be a fair amount quicker because it has this persistent disk there. So it's already got Docker installed. It's already got a bunch of stuff there already. Uh, that was a lot quicker. It took 15 minutes. It's not done yet. So let's see what, what is happening. So what it's done is running a container in Docker. And that, now it's going ahead and installing packages in and so on. So kind of at the outer level, it installs Docker and some other things, and then runs a Docker image. And then within the Docker image, once that's running, it goes ahead and, run and installs other stuff. So we can see it's installing other stuff. We'll let that go. So that is uh, running projects without WS. Let's just go and look and see what we did. So number one, this is page two. We clicked on the project start button, yes. We copied the text starting with wget, wget, yes. We're not on our own Ubuntu box. We're not using Google Colab. Instead, we're using Google Compute Engine. So we have steps three through seven at the bottom there. We go to the console. We go to the instances. We started it. We clicked on SSH. We pasted the copied text and executed. That's it. And there's probably a big step at the bottom, which is be patient, okay? Waiting for this to say running. Questions about that at this point? So what have I skipped here? I showed how to create the Cloudarizer project, and I showed how to start the Cloudarizer project for a 
GCE instance. What I didn't show is how to create the GCE instance. So let's go ahead and do that right now. Okay? Because we need to do something. So in GCE, so I'm here again in Google Compute Engine, VM Instances, Create Instance. And here, it's important what you choose. So I will call this one CS152. I will put it close to us. Wow, Los Angeles would be even closer. So maybe we should choose that. And so far, the machine I'm choosing is 30 bucks a month, right? Which sounds like a lot, but four cents a minute sounds a lot better. And it even tells us in case we don't know how many hours there are per month. So in case you wondered. Um, so I give it a name, I give it my region, I give it a machine type, and I'm going to give it four virtual CPUs. Yeah, which gives us some good amount of memory too. Uh, and I customize. What is it I want to customize about that hardware? I would like a GPU, because otherwise you're going to be waiting a long time doing your learning. So that's why we don't do Los Angeles, by the way, because we don't have GPU instances. So we go back to Oregon, like the instructions say, and now we can choose a GPU. And the Tesla K80 is cheap enough. Go ahead and use that. If we run into any issues for future assignments where we need a beefier GPU, we'll talk about that. So we'll just choose the default K80. And so far, ooh, we bumped it up. Right now we're 44 cents a minute. So we went from 4 cents to 44. GPUs are expensive. Uh, the second, next thing we need to do, so we customize the number of GPUs, boot disk. I learned the hard way this morning what happens if we don't do this. So we want Ubuntu 16.04, and 10 gigabytes is not a large enough disk. We need 30. I learned that one the hard way too. And the bad part about this is I learned it after I'd already printed out 26 copies of this on cardstock. So. And then once I realized the Ubuntu 16.04, I fixed it, I started printing again. And then I realized the boot disk problem. So, 30. If you want to pay a little extra, you can go for an SSD disk. Let's look at the difference in price. It won't show us right now, but it costs a little bit more. I think the standard disk is maybe six bucks a month, uh, and the SSD is somewhat more. Let's just go with standard. But it will make stuff run a little faster with an SSD. So we choose Ubuntu. We chose 30 gig. Great. Uh, firewall, we want to allow HTTP and HTTPS. Right? This is so we can do stuff like run Jupyter Notebook. Okay. Uh, management, security. This is where we go in and choose on for preemptible. Right? So we were paying how much? We were paying 45 cents a minute. And now, if we turn on our preemptible, we'll pay 17 cents a minute, well, 18 rounded. So, big discount. And now we can create. Okay. And now we have two instances. The CS152 instance is not running, and that's fine. If we look at disks, I, we now have two disks, and somewhere we could figure out how much we're being charged for them. Does that make sense for Google Compute Engine? So use this, you'll use up your 50 bucks. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm not sure if like, maybe I missed something, but like, um, like I, I get that the Google Compute Engine is kind of like where you get the CPU from. Um, what's exactly the point of capitalizing? Is there like to like write the code or something? So let's say you had a Google Compute Engine, you had an Ubuntu 16.04. Uh -huh. Now, what are you going to install on that? Um, well, perhaps. You've got to install the NVIDIA drivers in order to use the GPU. You've got to install CUDA, which is a library for it. You've got to install uh, a bunch of Ubuntu packages. You've got to get our Git there. So I could have written you a large script that you put in there. But then as well, what Cloudrise, so Cloudrizer does all that. It'll download Kaggle data sets for you. And it sets up Google Drive so that you have a disk on this machine that it can read and write to that will synchronize with a directory in Google Drive. 
So a couple things. One, so that you have some permanent output. Okay, if you're running using collaborate, yeah, so you have an easy way to get permanent output, and so that if you change where you're running, it'll go with you. So let's say, for instance, I create a model. I train a model for an hour on my GPU, and it's this good model that's doing dog breed identification. I want to save that model to be able to use it later. So I'll save it, and now, if that's in Google Drive, I can come back later and reload it. How do you save the model? Do you save the weights? It's code. Yeah, we save the weights. Uh, yeah, that's basically what it is. Well, we'll see an example here today. What do you write code? Where? Yeah. Usually, you're doing all your code writing in Jupyter Notebook. So you've got a notebook open, and you're writing your Python code in there. <coughs> Which notebook? It's not on my local website. It's running on whatever your machine is via Clouderizer, because that makes things slightly easier. So you will have a remote Jupyter Notebook server that you're connecting to. Can you show us how to get that remote Well, see if it's running yet. Oh. So that seems fine. Hey, it's still starting. How nice. But it's performing startup tasks, so that must be almost done, right? So when these become enabled, we'll click on Jupyter, and that'll get us a Jupyter Notebook. So from the two ways, we go to setup, Python packages, pip. You just can put in all the Python packages you want. In our particular case, there aren't any. And you think, well, that's weird. And the reason for that is we have a startup script that installs here the FastAI library. And the FastAI library, because of its requirements, pulls in everything else we need. It pulls in PyTorch. It pulls in NumPy, it pulls in pandas, all that stuff. So, so, but if there were any additional pip ones you wanted, you would do it back on that previous page. And the advantage of doing that, of course, rather than going into your running instance and installing it, is then this will be done wherever and whenever you run. So on the we have like first code or project that you need. You send someone to that So here, it's just in community projects. Everyone in the world can clone our, pro our project. So there's a community projects tab within Clouderizer, which is right here. And there are maybe a dozen projects, and one of them is ours. Wait, that's it? Like, all of Clouderizer? Clouderizer is kind of small. Like, it's a one-person shop, I believe. Wait, so like, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's all of them that exist. That, these are they. Yep. <laughs> So I think you can find it. <laughs> and these questions are good as, so what's happening now? Why does it say it's not running? Oh, it's down here at the bottom and it's running. Great, so how do we get to Jupyter? So you need to keep in mind, we're gonna run a terminal window here. Do we already have a terminal window running? Yes, right here. This terminal window is running to our raw instance. The terminal window here is not our raw instance. The terminal window here is our Docker container that's running within our raw instance. So we have a sub-operating system running within our raw instance. And this happens to have the password Clouderizer. Okay? Does the distinction make sense? Rarely will we want to work in the raw instance. The only thing we'll do in the raw instance is paste in our little command line from Clouderizer to start stuff running. From then on, once it's up and running, we're going to be using this terminal window from Clouderizer. Okay. So Drew. Google, Google Compute Engine. Yes. Yes. That's how we created that raw instance. And then all sub instances are created through Cloudrizer. Exactly. Uh, Yes, the shell script, the shell window is. Yeah, so, yeah. What about the path directories? Like, are they the same as the path directories? Like, what are the files that are the same? Is it in the. Let's look, at the, let's look in here. So, we're at the console. Here we are. So, we've got a Clouderizer directory. I guess we should go in there. And within the Clouderizer directory, you have a directory for every one of your projects. 
okay? If I looked at my Google Drive, I would see a bunch, right? You saw I had a bunch of projects. I'd have a bunch of these directories. Here, a given project, you only see that project uh, directory. So, and within here, three special directories, code, data, and out. Code gets, let's see if I get these right, two-way synced to Google Drive. And the first time you run it, it gets initialized from the given Git repository. So if I go into code, and I do an ls minus a, I see I have a Git directory. All right, so it was initialized from Git. Once it's been initialized, it never repulls anything from Git. So from here on out, this code directory is gonna just be maintained in Google Drive. So I make changes in Clouderizer, and it'll go over to Google Drive, and then when I start up again, it'll come back from Google Drive. So I'll have the same code, that is the same notebooks, because this is what's in this code, is the notebooks. But what that means is if I push new stuff to the Git uh, repository, which I will be doing, you won't see it in your project unless you do what? Pull. And speaking of which, I do have a Git cheat sheet to hand out, just in case. If you're already cool with Git, you can get rid of that if you like, but we do a Git pull. And we're already up to date, that's fine. But I, I may tell you in the future as we're working on stuff, hey, I've got a new notebook out there, do a git pull. Uh, in the code directory is a notebooks directory. And that includes lesson one, lesson two, and an images directory because the notebooks have a couple images in them. Okay? So last week we were looking at lesson one, today we're gonna look at lesson two. So I'm gonna be going through that in some detail. All right. So if I make changes to my notebook of lesson two, like let's go over here and let's open our Jupyter notebook. And I look at my code directory and notebooks and I open lesson two. And in a matter of minutes, seconds. Okay. So if I go back to my terminal window here, and I look at the date for the notebooks. So lesson two is September 12th at 629. Eighteen twenty-nine, and it says right now we're eighteen thirty-five because I guess we're we don't have the right time zone. So that's dated from six minutes ago. If I go into Jupiter Lab and I make a change here, so I add some exclamation points, and I choose save. <coughs> then if I come back to the console, it's updated. Okay, and where else is it going to be? In, the in your Google Drive, Clouderizer, CS152, Code, Notebooks, it'll get done there. It's about every two minutes, I think, is what it does. So it's not 100% live, but it does get put up there. So that's good, because then the next time you run, it'll get copied back. So there's the code directory. There's the data directory. And if we look at the data directory, it's got two, it's got dogs, cats. So that's the one we downloaded as a zip file and opened into here and that has the models and sample and training and valid and so on. And if I look at competitions, this is the raw Kaggle data. So I can see here I have, in fact it's so handy it's all zipped. So I'm gonna need to unzip it in order to do anything useful for, with it, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. The data does not get synced to your Google Drive. 
And the reason for that is you may have a lot of large data sets, and you don't particularly want them to be synced to your Google Drive. There's a one-way sync that happens. If you put stuff in the data director, directory, it'll be copied down. So if there's data sets that you want to get to your um, Clouderizer instance, then just put it in your data directory, and it'll be moved over. We're going to be using Kaggle data sets mostly, and it's much easier to just go ahead and specify the Kaggle data set and have it downloaded for you. So when you're doing the dog breed identification, are you going to leave these as zip files? No, you're going to want to unzip those. And you are going to, so now let's go back to your assignment for a second. So in the assignment, middle way down the page, it says import the data set into the FastAI library. And it says approach one you, is using Python and or shell commands, create a directory structure similar to that in the cats and dogs. And then you can use the image classifier data from PaaS to load it. Because it'll be loading just like dogs and cats does. So that's one way to do it. If you are doing this um, modifying the directory structure, then let me ask you this. Are you going to do that from the command line here? Or are you going to do it in Jupyter Notebook? Could you do it here? Would it work? I go ahead and unzip the files. I maybe make some subdirectories. I move stuff around. Use shell commands. Or I guess I could even write Python right here if I wanted, right? And use the Python interpreter. You could do the same thing here, right? I can execute um, Python here. And I can also. by putting an exclamation, execute shell commands. Like, I don't know, let's say ls. So you can do the work either place. What are you going to be turning in? So where should your work be? Right. Put it here, because this is what you're turning in. You're not turning in what's in the terminal window. You're turning in what's in the notebook. That's all I'll see. So if you need to do some rearrangement of your files, do it in here. Uh, approach number two is you're given a CSV file, uh, which is let's just see what's in here. So we'll unzip that. So we got a bunch of test files, and we have a labels.csv, and let's just look at that. Labels.csv includes an ID number and a breed. So that's really all the information you need, right? This wired harriered fox terrier, what's the label? It's wire harriered fox terrier. And what's the day then the so this is the output. And what's the input? Train slash big number dot JPEG. Okay. The fast AI library also knows how to kind of deal with this sort of a format. And so with a different um, loading, so from CSV, you can load that. However, in the first case where we made directory structures, we were going to have a directory structure with train and a directory structure with valid. So it would be up to us to randomly take a subset of them and put some in valid and some in train. Here, loading from the CSV file, there's only training data. So when you are loading from a CSV, you can specify which of the indexes, like line 3 and line 50 and line 100 and so on, will all be valid ones, validation ones. And there's a useful routine to randomly come up with a set of subset of numbers in here of a given percentage. So this is going to require some, some, some exploration. All right, so here we are. Let's go ahead and... Let's see. All right, uh, how do we execute a, a cell? Shift enter. Oh, wait a second. What if we had 
a Jupyter notebook, keyboard shortcuts, cheat sheet. All right. So shift enter will execute. And what does the star mean in the left hand? It means it's executing. Surprisingly slowly. And what's the number mean? It's not the line. It's the, the nth command that's executed in this notebook. So that was the second one that executed. And now I'll do this one. And that's now the third one. So depending on the order you execute things, you'll get different numbers there. Uh, our architecture, the, the type of the neural network we're using is ResNet 34. The path, that is where is the data, is up to data and dogs, cats. We've already got the dogs, cat zip file. Again, if we look at what's in here, models valid sample train test one. Don't know why they have a one there. If we look at the first five files within test one, we see there's some JPEG files. So our goal is to label those, right? That's our, our goal here, according to Kaggle, is label all of those dogs. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and so from paths, that's that example I just told you about, right? We're going to say we have the special directory hierarchy where one directory name is dog, so we have train, and then dogs and cats. So dogs and cats are the labels. Transformations we're going to do are going to be from this model. That is, we're going to transform the input JPEGs to be of this size, 224 by 224. Uh, and we have a test directory called test1. So that's where our tests are. So this data object knows about training data, knows about validation data, and also, because we told it, knows about test data as well. So it knows about all three. And then, and I should have started running this first, we'll go ahead and maybe I didn't run this one. So again, we got some initial setup where we're downloading the weights. And now we're going to go through and pre-process all of the images, right? Pre-compute those activations of the next to the last layer. And that'll make our subsequent epochs run faster. And while it's doing that, let's just read ahead, OK? Once that we have our trained model, we want to go ahead and label our test data. The test DS, so data is our data object here. Test DS is the test data set within it, and it has file names. So let's look at the first 10 of them. Oh, and we can't because it's running the other cell. But it was some JPEG files, basically. ID number .jpeg. Here's how we're going to do our prediction. So our learner here we've, is, our, is our model, basically, that we have fit eventually. And we predict with targets. That is, we want predictions, that is, probabilities, and labels for our data. If you, get, if you don't put in your test data, it's going to use validation data. We don't want validation data, though. We want the test data. So we say, is test equal true? And these predictions that come back are actually logarithms of probabilities. Right? We're logarithms of numbers between 0 and 1. We need to exponentiate them before. What is this np? NumPy. And this? Exponent. So we have a vector of probabilities, sorry, a vector of real numbers, and it takes the exponent here. Now, what if you didn't know that? What if you had a NumPy cheat sheet? OK? I got to tell you, the thing I'm most happy with is a couple of years ago, I bought a printer, right, an inkjet printer. 
that doesn't have ink in the cartridges. It has wells to put the ink in, and the ink is dirt cheap. Um, so every time I print in color, I'm like, I love this. It's almost free. The problem, of course, is the printer. They charge you up front a lot of money for it. Anyway, um, so let's see how this is doing. So our first epoch we ran, and we're running through our second epoch. So the first 100% was what? Downloading the weights. The second 100% was pre-computing those activations of all of the images. And then the third one is our epoch that is running through all of the images, really running through all the pre-computed activations and adjusting weights. And then we do it another time here. Here? Oh, 0 0.01, that's a good question. That is the learning rate. We're going to look a little bit later and see how, you, how, you, how we knew what that was. That is an example of what kind of a thing? Hyperparameter, exactly. So your validation, I take it back. That was the first epoch, and this is the second epoch. So once we got the epochs going, it worked pretty well. And I'm confused about these. So we got an accuracy of 99% right now. Are we overfit? No, because? Yeah, our validation loss, we have negative variance, right? If we look at bison variance. So we're, we're better than our training for some reason. that I, it's, it's not common here. But we're definitely not overfit. Are we underfit? Maybe. We could maybe get better than this, this training loss. Right? We could look and see what errors it's making and so on. But for now, this looks good. We probably can fit it better. Yeah. This was running it on the training data, correct? This is running on the training data, yes. Training. So, because we're back up to where we were training it. It's a little confusing because we went back later and then looked at the test. So, now we got this, we can go ahead and calculate what our predictions are for the test. And it didn't print anything, so that's confusing. Probabilities.shape. So, 12,500. Yeah, there are 12,500 test images, so that's a lot. And the two is representing what? Two classes, cats and dogs. Which is first? I don't know. Let's check. Oh, classes says cats is first and dogs is second. So the first index will be cats and the second one would be dogs. Uh, let's just look at the dog probabilities. And we see you know, some high and some low. Like this is probably a dog, and the 0.01 is a cat, and this one is a dogish cat. Now we create a pandas data frame. How many people have used pandas? Half about. Well, let's say we might need a panda cheat sheet. Okay? So the pandas has data frames, and basically it's rows and columns. Think of it like a spreadsheet. That's kind of what it's doing. You're, you're, you're working on an in memory spreadsheet. And there are easy ways to import and export to and from CSV files. Okay. So I'm going to create a panda data frame. And I'm using, what's this colon here? All of the rows in here. Column one and beyond. There are only two columns, so this is just that one column. So basically, we're pulling out the dogs. And the reason for that, if I went and looked at the Kaggle, um, submission, it says the submission is ID number and probability that there's a dog. So we're going to just throw away the probability it's a cat. And this df.columns equals label. Oh, that says what the name of that column is. Okay, so we have a a single column that's probably just a dog, and it's called label. How did I know it's label? Because I looked at the Kaggle uh, sample submission. In fact, if 
we look here, sample submission, let's unzip that. And we see, we, oh my goodness, uh, that's for the uh, dog breed identification. But it's a similar ID, uh, idea, ID and then all of the headers. In our case, for the dogs and cats, we're supposed to just say label. So that's why we put label there. And then we want a new column that has the ID number for the associated labels. So names is the file names in order of our test data. We're going to go through and iterate through those and pull out the six. What's the six? Let's go back and look at what one of these looks like. Right, we want after the slash. So we're skipping the test one slash. And the negative four? Kicking out the JPEG. Yes. Wait a second. What if I didn't know that? What if I had a Python 3 data cheat, a cheat sheet? OK, we're running out of cheat sheets, by the way. All right, so we do this. And now we have a second column. Where is the second column with respect to the first? It's the left, because the first parameter in df.insert, which presumably pandas would show us about. And now if we look at ahead, we see we have IDs and labels. All right, we're getting close now. Right? We have a pandas data frame that shows us what we want. We just need to get this into a CSV file. So we're going to write this into an output directory. We didn't really have to make this formatted because we're not using any um, uh, string formatting here, but it doesn't hurt. We're going to make sure the out directory exists. We know that it does. And then we're going to write to CSV, dogs, cats, simple, two. I think I did this a number of times. Gzipped compression, index is false. Don't know what that is. We'd have to look that up. All right, let's go look. Uh, oh my goodness, there it is. Where will this show up? It'll show up in my Google Drive, and in fact, let's see, is that Dropbox or is that Google Drive? Is that it's Google Drive? It updated two minutes ago. It's probably updating about every two minutes as we keep changing the, the um, so, if I went to Google Drive, I would see it within a couple of minutes. How do I download this file? Probably the simplest thing to do would be just navigate to it. So go to the out directory and right click. Let's look at this a second. It says here, right click. So that's good. Right click and download. And it's dogcat simple to one, because I've already done this before. All right, now we can upload it to Kaggle. Let's go ahead and do that. Kaggle. We do not want the dog breed. We want the dog cat. Dogs versus cats read. There we go. All right. Uh, since the contest is already over, all we can do is a late submission. Let's go ahead and make a submission. So we will upload from our downloads directory that file we just created and describe it uh, in class live. And there we go. We got a score of 0 0.06073. On the public leaderboard, if we look at where we are, it very quickly loads it. 
any minute. It'll have loaded it. What is it, 0.06073 or something? So not bad. We're at 129, 130, yeah, out of 1,200. Right, and the guy in fourth place did 435 submissions to get to fourth place. So, so that is basically what you will be doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, true. So basically, basically using the like library to do the classification, it's more like understanding the environment. Am I, am I correct? That's right. Being able to actually do an end to end right. training. Classification, submitting to Kaggle, you're going to learn more than, you know, when you leave this class, you'll more, know more than just, oh, I run learn.fit and it works. Okay. Other questions? All right, let me show you. I'm just trying to figure something out. Uh, yeah, let's look here. Okay, so the learning rate. That was a question one of you came up with. So um, what is the learning rate? And here's the idea of, of, of the learning rate is uh, we are going to – right, we're doing an optimization problem on a very skewed coordinate system. Um, so in a multi-dimensional space, but let's look at just a two-dimensional space. So let's say we're trying to minimize this, and we happen to be starting at a point, you know, somewhere on the curve that is here. What we're going to do is use the slope to help us find the minimum. Okay, so the slope of this is, let's say, here. And so we're going to go down some amount. More, the steeper it is. But how much is the question. Because if we go too far, let's say we go all the way to here. Okay? So we take this down here, and then we'll drop down. Right? That gives us our x value. So it's really hard being skewed. Okay? So that goes to here. And now we've got a slope that's less, so we're not going to go as far, but we'll maybe go here. And now our slope is down, and so we'll go back over here. And eventually, it looks like it'll converge. However, what if we had a much higher learning rate? That is, we said, okay, we've got a given slope. We're going to go a far ways in that direction. So we'll start here, and we're going to go all the way over to here. Okay? And then from here, we're going to go, let's say, over to here. And then we're up here, and we're going to go you know, there, and so on. And so we could diverge from where we want to go. So a good learning rate is big enough that it still converges. Because right? the disadvantage of a too big a learning rate is that we, we don't converge, we, don't, yeah, we overshoot. And then we overshoot more and more. If we have too small a learning, the disadvantage is it's, it's slow and you can also get stuck in a local minimum. So this idea of overshooting is kind of nice if you have you know, something like this. And if you're over here, it'd be nice if you can get out of those hills. Okay. So. So how do you find a learning rate? Well, uh, there's a paper that shows how to do it, but basically a simple thing to do is right, create a learner and call learning rate find, right, which is basically does this. So what it does is it just goes through and does some training and just keeps increasing the learning rate more and more and more. And if we look at our schedule, right, number of iterations, and this is the learning rate that it's going to be using. So it's going to go from something small to point, you know, all the way to 
to, to one. And one is very high. And then we plot our loss versus our, versus our learning rate. It's not for all of our training data, it's just you know, for, it was for a sample of the training data. So this says, if we are using, well, if we're using a learning rate of 10 point negative five, our validation loss is up here. If we go to 10 to negative four, it's lower. It's getting lower, it's getting lower. It's at our minimum, uh-oh, we're going back up, right, because we're overshooting. We don't want to use this learning rate. We actually want this learning rate where we're still making a progress here. So we basically go to the minimum, go back one on a factor of 10, and use that as our learning. So that's where we get 0.01. Why do we need We're looking for a case where the learning rate is causing a decreasing loss rather than kind of plateauing out. All right, improving our model. There are improvements we can make. I talked about the augmenting our data set, right? We can improve our, mo our model if we add more data. But we don't actually have more data. But we can fake more data, right? Flip them around, zoom in and out, rotate a little bit. Would you want to flip up and down? Not for this data, right? You, don't rarely, you rarely see these upside down dog and cat pictures. If we were doing satellite images of houses, yeah, you would want to flip them up and down too because you could easily see in any, any orientation. So transform side on is a set that uh, a fast AI has of transforms that sort of fit very well. And you can specify how much zooming you want. You don't want to do too much. So um, We can look at some augmentations. In fact, let's just show here. So this is the same picture that's generated six different augmented values, right? So it's kind of, I mean, you can imagine, yeah, this would be better. It, as far as the neural net's concerned, this is a lot better than just one. So if you want to do augmentations, our transformations are now going to include that transformation and include augmentation. And we do the same thing we did before. And then we fit. Now here, we're going to fit somewhat differently. Before, when we fit, we just provided a learning rate of 0.01, which is a still 0.01, and the number of epochs. Cycle length is, is, is interesting. So let's start this running, and we'll look at what happens. Basically, what happens is, so that's going to go ahead and run. It's going to run slower because it's not pre-computing the activations. Right? It's not downloading the weights, because we already have those, but it's not going to pre-compute the activation, so it's just going to go through each image, and for each image, randomly perturb it and send that into the um, training, to train the, train the model. So we're 29% through the first epoch. It's going to take us three epochs. So what's the cycle length? The idea is we want to do this uh, annealing of the learning rate. Annealing is, I think, the term they use for um, if you're forging metal and you quench it right, by putting it in water, that's a form of, of annealing. Um, the, so what we do is decreasing the temperature, basically. So we're going to decrease the learning rate as we go. We kind of can get the best of both worlds. We use larger learning rates to begin with, to move around to fight rough, roughly where we're going to go, and then smaller learning rates to, to get there. Um, but you might still get stuck in a local minimum. And so the idea then is, go back to some large learning rates again that could maybe take you out of there, and then slow it down again. So, and then increase it, and then slow it down again. So, there's a picture here with this cyclical rate that just kind of shows it quickly moving and then slowly and quickly and slowly. So these jumps. Here it's smooth because we're using a single learning rate. Here we get to have some jumps. And so if we look at a schedule, the learning rate changes over time, right? So it starts at 0.01 
and then we're going to reduce it. So 0.01 is the highest it'll ever be, and then we'll reduce it over time. And then after that first epoch, we'll jump it up again and reduce it, jump it up again and reduce it. As we're going through each epoch, by the way, if we've got a particular image, uh, our funny cat, are we going to see it at the same point in each of these epochs? You imagine if we had the same sequence of images that we saw for each epoch, then some of the images would always have a higher learning rate, some of the images would always have a lower learning rate. We wouldn't want that. So that's why for every epoch, we're randomly shuffling the data as we go through it. All right, this is probably still running up here. Yes, it's still running. Learn.save is what's used to save uh, a model, that is to save the weights. And learn.load reloads it. So these get saved in I think it's the data directory, let's see. in the models here. So yes, so I believe once this finishes, we can go ahead and save that, and it will be saved in that directory. Now the problem is that directory is in the data directory, and the data directory only gets synced one way, from Google Drive to our machine here. So if we want to get it out and actually save it permanently, we need to do what with it? Where should we put it? In the out directory, because that out directory gets synced back and forth. So that's part of the reason for the out directory. Okay? So that this expensive time we have spent training this, we can actually save it and use it later. Uh, and then we could, you know, re-predict, resubmit, and then there's a final thing we can do which is, for data augmentation, we were using data augmentation at training time, right? You can use data augmentation at inference time, at the time you're trying to figure out your predictions. So the idea is TTA, test time augmentation, instead of just feeding your image in, it's going to feed your image in and four augmentations based on the transforms you set up. Okay, so it'll feed in the cat, and a zoomed-in cat, and a rotated cat, and a scaled cat, and so on. Does that part make sense? Yeah? So at, at testing time, if you want to feed in different like, transformations of the same image, is that trying to get a better sense of what that original image really is? Like possibly it was, if we did this process in the training time, possibly now if we were to do the same thing Yes, so the fact that you're doing these augmentations at training time and in the test time means you may get a better idea. And the other reason is, let's say, let's say you didn't do these augmentations at training time. You're just doing it at test time. Maybe the incoming image is rotated, and it has seen only unrotated images, you know? And part of what we're doing in our augmentation is we're rotating it back towards sort of normal. It says, oh, wait, that looks like a cat, you know? So the other thing is we just, yeah, we're giving it more of a chance by having these, these slightly different augmented versions. Okay. What we get back then in our log predictions is no longer an array of 25,000 by 2. Instead, it's 25,000 by 5 by 2, where the 5 are the original image and the four augmentations. And what you're given then are those log predictions. And what you can do is then exp uh, exponentiate them and take the mean. That's the, the idea. You'll get slightly better results. And you can see actually just right here, on this particular example I did, we got 0.9905 accuracy without test time augmentation and 0.992 with. So that doesn't look like much. But if you think about it, right, this is 
what is this, 0 0.0095 error, and this is 0 0.008. So we're really reducing the error by almost 15%. So that's a big chunk. When you are doing your assignment, I encourage you to try and get a good score on your CAG competition, but I'm not actually going to use that for grading. What I really want is more end-to-end. -end. But feel free to explore using the data augmentation both at training time and at test time and to use the um, uh, cycling. All right. Let's show you the last piece, which is setting up using collaboratory. And it's not going to finish because we only have three minutes left. But let me go ahead and I'm going to stop this one. Okay, so I've stopped it. It was running on Google Compute Engine, so what do we know? I'm still paying. So I'll go over here. Actually, I've got two running. Say that again? It didn't, uh, when I came into the class, it had been running, and I never stopped it. So, so if we come back now, see, here I am. Let's go to collab.research.google.com. And according to the LIMP cheat sheet, what do we want to do for running on collab? I think I don't know what the right answer is. I could see you doing it either way. So, and I'm not sure that we're going to be keeping the same pairs for future assignments. So maybe it would be best just to have your own Cloudrizer assignment, or Cloudrizer, I would think, and just pick one of you to do it for this particular assignment. So, all right, so we create a new Python 3 per notebook, or you can use an existing Python 3 notebook. Either one is fine. I just have now a lot, Untitled 5, Untitled 6, Untitled 7. That's step four, create a new one. Step five is change to GPU. If you don't change the GPU, you will be very unhappy. And then, from Cloudarizer, you're going to say start. Notice this is the same one I was using for Google Compute Engine. I'm using it exactly the same way for Colab. And I go back over here. And this is a shell command, right? So what do I need to do in order to be able to execute it? Exclamation point. And there it goes. It's, it's so fast you can't even see the output. And there it goes. I say it takes some time. Anyway, um, if you have questions on this, Piazza is, a, is, is the best approach. If there are any typos or errors on, on any of these cheat sheets, it's probably worth noting that in Piazza so everyone doesn't have to independently uh, figure that, find that out. Does it say 2019? <laughs> OK. Um, it's actually due next Wednesday night.